Okay, let me invite uh, all of you. I think we have had Vanessa join us, Bertram join us, Pearl join us. Of course, uh, we've already acknowledged Vincent. Thank you all for joining us. Let me begin with a prayer and uh, we will pray for some of these thoughts that we just uh, mentioned. And uh, we will continue with our study today, which will once again be led by Praveen. Join me as I pray. Our loving, gracious Father, we just want to uh, once again show our sense of faith as we bow our heads and acknowledge you as the God of the universe, the God who cares and loves and has a great, great purpose for us that, Lord, we will someday soon be able to uh, materialize and uh, experience in its fullness. And even as we say that, our hearts are heavy with uh, the loss of uh, Mr. Nirale, who was a member of the church for so many years, over three decades. And uh, one of those very faithful members, Lord Almighty, we know that uh, he was suffering quite a bit towards the end. We thank you that his, hopefully his uh, end was peaceful. We pray, Lord for the comfort for the family and uh, the funeral arrangements, which are yet to be decided. We pray that everything goes smoothly. And uh, indeed, we look forward to the time of reunion uh, in the resurrection. We just want to remember Surya Murthy as he uh, struggles with uh, this health issue. We pray for his full recovery and healing. And of course, uh, Lord Almighty, thank you for the Nagas who, for me personally, have been friends for a very long time. And uh, what a joy it is for us to, um, to witness that they have crossed 51 years of their wedding. We thank you for their testimony. We thank you for the tremendous example they are. We pray and ask for uh, many more wonderful years that they can enjoy together. We thank you that we can now meet together for this Bible study. We ask for your loving presence, for your guidance. The Holy Spirit may continue to open our minds and hearts to uh, vital truth, which is slowly being lost in a, in a very secular world, in a materialistic world. We pray, Lord, you will continue to help us have the interest of knowing the scriptures even as they are now being brought to us by Praveen, we commit them into your hands. We commit the study into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you all for joining again. Let me in, uh, uh, invite Oprakash as well as Sanjeev Rao. I think he's still connecting. Over to you, Praveen. Okay. Good, good evening, all. And uh, I'm glad that we could continue our study uh, this week also. And last week we have seen uh, the life of Apostle Paul and uh, the le lessons we can learn from the Apostle Paul. And this time we'll be uh, discussing more on the theological themes that are introduced by Apostle Paul. Uh, if you read the New Testament, there are various theological themes. And uh, some of them were introduced by Jesus, and some of them by Peter, and some of them by John, yeah. and uh, few we can see. Uh, <clears throat> okay. uh, so various themes were introduced by various apostles, but majority of those Christian theological beliefs were being given to us by Apostle Paul, since he, him, his writings constitute, uh, they, they are almost like 25% of the New Testament. And even in Book of Acts, his life is one of the major characters. If you see in the entire New Testament, there are two characters for their life has been uh, presented in an elaborated manner. That is the life of Jesus. And the second person is Apostle Paul. So Apostle Paul introduced various theological things. Some of them uh, were through his, uh, uh, his experience and some of them from the revelation that he has received as a, 
uh, he also writes in Galatians that after his uh, encounter with Jesus, he, may, he was taken to Arabia where he spent three years in the presence of God, where God has revealed various uh, uh, things to him and which he returned and then started teaching in Antioch and other parts of the world. So what we'll do, we'll look into these theological themes and all these theological themes are quite deep, are uh, very essential to Christian belief and doctrine. Uh, perhaps uh, I'm not sure if we could be, if we could spend more time on each of them because uh, even spending time on one theological theme will take so much of time. But uh, we'll try to uh, go fast and uh, so that we may not uh, take so we may we may close we may conclude this series soon. Uh, as of now, I have chosen ten theological themes from Apostle Paul's life. There are many. Uh, but these 10 are very important. So 10 theological themes I have taken. And in case if any theological theme that you found out in your own study and you noticed and uh, from your reading, uh, please feel free to uh, share it with us uh, during the discussion time it can be. And even after that also, in case if you like to share any information to me, uh, so that I can think about it and study about it and bring and present it to you. Please feel free to do so. And the 10 theological themes that I have chosen uh, now, and uh, I'll try to finish as much as possible uh, uh, in this session. Otherwise, we will continue it in the next week. The primary thing is, uh, primary theological theme is Trinitarian monotheism. That is something uh, we can find in Apostle Paul's theology. And the second one is church is the body of Christ. I will be giving my entire notes to you at the end of uh, uh, all these sessions. So uh, you can get all my notes also. So second thing, second thing is church is the body of Christ. And the third thing is union with God. And the fourth is equality of all humanity. And uh, fifth purpose of the law and uh, in other words teleological understanding of the law or teleological perspective of the law and then baptism he has given entirely a new perspective new understanding of uh, Christian baptism and then vicarious humanity of uh, Jesus this may sound similar to the uh, you know substitutionary understanding of death of Jesus, but it is quite different. And substitution is part of vicarious humanity of Jesus, but vicarious humanity of Jesus much more bigger than the substitutionary atonement you talk about, substitutionary life of Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, one topic uh, you have already discussed very much that is um, uh, that is taken from Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, or we can even talk uh, in the theological term for that is Ebionism. There is a uh, perspective called Ebionism, and they, uh, uh, they started influencing the New Testament church. Apostle Paul was very strongly teaching against it. And then uh, uh, finally, the return of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead. Um, this is actually, of course, all the apostles taught about return of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead. But Apostle Paul is the only one who started writing the change, the shift in understanding about uh, the coming of the Lord. So that we will be discussing as we are continuing in our study. Let us start with our first theme which is Trinitarian monotheism. We all know Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, which means he was believing in one God. And in, in, even if you go, uh, if you clearly want to say, they were believing in monad monotheism, which means there is only one God and one person God. That is Jewish monotheism. Jewish monotheism and uh, Islam, they believe in monad monotheism. There is only one person and one God. Uh, so that is where they were believing and uh, Pharisee, Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. So he was very strongly taught 
uh, in that perspective and he was advocating and speaking for that perspective. First thing he uh, learned was Trinitarian monotheism. And uh, he reflects the same in all his epistles. If you read his epistles, all the epistles start with these kind of greetings. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. These are the themes, uh, these are the names Apostle Paul always used uh, in his greetings which tells that he is not interested in writing and speaking about a monad monotheistic God, but he is interested in a God who is a father. Father of whom? Father of the son. How are the father and the son? In the spirit. So Apostle Paul's understanding is not into, he is not interested in exploring more about the Monon monotheistic God, but this Trinitarian monotheistic God with his <coughs> uh, encounter with Jesus, he realized Jesus is the son of God. And then he is very much interested in introducing God, who is <coughs> the father of the son. In other words, father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians, book of Ephesians starts with very beautiful statement, uh, especially from verse three onwards, you see. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly realms, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in him. So he is bringing the theme that he has chosen us in Christ even before the foundation of the world. Who is this God? This God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's calling Lord Jesus is... Uh, is uh, calling Jesus as God. So, Apostle Paul, he is very much interested and he, uh, in all his salutations, he was using the Trinitarian understanding of God. He doesn't want us to be mistaken because of his Phariseeism or whatever. Uh, he, he wanted to, under, he wants us to understand that the God we are worshipping is Father, Son and the Holy Spirit that he clearly expresses in his salutations. And his explanation in all the epistles and in his conclusions also. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, which is the most famous uh, statement we all use every Sunday. That is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is a benediction. Here also, he brings the Trinitarian monotheistic God, God who is three, uh, three in one or one in three. So <clears throat> he is interested in express, uh, teaching about this Trinitarian God. And, and not only that, Apostle Paul, very interestingly, uh, uh, very interestingly, he presents Trinitarian uh, or threefold experience of humanity. As I said, in his salutations and his conclusion, he was using Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not only that, he, he realized, <coughs> excuse me, he realized or understood and was explaining all our human life is included or our human life has to be explained uh, with these three persons of the Trinity. One example I will bring to you, there are several, but one example we can find in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 to 11, where it is written, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of the righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raises, uh, raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit and who dwells in you. And there are so many ways, but here uh, uh, here the hopeful message uh, that we can take is about the resurrection. And even as we uh, were saddened by the demise of Mr. Ndale, we all have the hope of 
the resurrection, I mean, the resurrected life, and we all are going to be resurrected and we are going to meet our beloved ones. That is a very strong Christian hope. And no other religion offers that. Even in that hope, look how Apostle Paul is presenting the threefold experience. Number one is the spirit. It is a spirit. The spirit is the spirit of Christ. And the spirit is the spirit of the father. And father raised Jesus through the spirit and the same way he is going to raise us through the spirit. So father, son and the Holy Spirit and three of them are completely involved in our resurrection and the resurrected life. And there are so many other experiences also. I will, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, I will share, share them with you. And even one simple verse is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 where he says, uh, for through him we have access by one spirit to the Father. This is about our worship. Through Jesus Christ, we have access to the Father through one spirit. So our worship is a threefold uh, experience. Our hope is a threefold experience. Uh, and then um, even our living, the way we are living is also threefold experience. So for Apostle Paul, our life also a threefold experience where Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are involved and which, uh, the, which cannot be separated. So Paul is very focused about the God whom we are worshipping, that the God is Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And then having said that, we'll move to the next theological theme. This is one of the <clears throat> very great theological themes from Apostle Paul, that is church is the body of Christ. This is something revolutionary. Nobody thought the church, what, is the, what the church is. People think church is a group of people. Church is an organization. Church is a society. So it can be a trust. You know, it can be a religious center or some church is a place where people come and worship. Okay, so there are so many kinds of understanding, but Apostle Paul brings entirely a new perspective and he calls the church as the body of Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, we find, he writes, now rejoice in my suffering, uh, sorry, I, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Church is the body of Christ that he is writing. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, there also he, he writes, uh, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And you find number of <coughs> scriptures and places where Apostle Paul calls the church as the body of Christ and Christ is the head of the church and we are various parts of the body. And uh, so that explanation, I don't need to speak more about that. But it is a revolutionary teaching for, for the first church also. And in, uh, not only that, even till now, it should be considered as a revolutionary teaching. No religious organization, no religion considered as a body of the deity itself. And no, all the, all the religions and uh, these groups are considered as group of people or associations. But here we all we are not united by just perspectives, but we are united by the person that is Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians, as he writes, uh, in Jesus he made us one family. In fact, the family members of God. So we all are made one family and then even, even uh, deep, deeply he said we are the body of Christ. How did Apostle Paul come to know that the church is the body of Christ? It is nothing but from the experience, the uh, encounter he had with Jesus. Apostle Paul was very fervently and uh, uh, fiercely was persecuting the church. We all know about it. As he was persecuting in his encounter, Jesus asked him a question, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That was recorded in Acts chapter uh, 9 as well as in 22. I'm taking from Acts 22. Acts 22 verse 7 says, and I fell, uh, Apostle Paul is sharing his testimony. And, uh, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
this is a trans uh, i mean you know, single statement that transformed apostle paul uh, his life and this is the root of this theological theme church is the body of christ paul never saw jesus never met jesus paul never uh, met jesus or uh, he didn't uh, arrest him or he didn't torture him and here comes jesus and says saul saul why are you persecuting me in fact apostle paul i mean paul saul was persecuting the church and here jesus says as you are persecuting the church you are persecuting me so from which he brought this thought church is a body of christ if i hurt the church christ gets hurt so that's that's a basic simple thing he can understand that's how he developed <clears throat> this theological theme that church is the body of christ and this is some something another another thing also we can consider uh, when we talk church is a body of christ it is talking about uh, un uh, unification of entire humanity in spite of all the diversions and the distinctions we have and which we are going to discuss a uh, little more further in the next, in the following theological theme so and we are not united by perspective but we are united by by a person that is jesus that's why jesus is the head of the church and we are his we are the members of his body and we'll move to the next theological theme that is union with god apostle john also spoke about union with god and but apostle paul is the one who spoke uh, much about it um, before apostle john wrote his letters and the gospels colossians chapter 1 verse 27 uh yeah, we it's like you know to them god well to make known so the mystery which was hidden from ages uh, now god revealed it to his holy apostles to them god veiled to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the gentiles which is christ in you the hope of glory the first thing we can find in colossians and in fact the en entire theme of book of colossians is christ is in us if you read book of uh, colossians this is the most repeated statement and this is a theme that will be uh, that we will find from chapter 1 till the last chapter connecting all the teachings in, uh, mentioned in the <clears throat> epistle so christ is in us the hope of glory so christ is in us number 1 number 2 colossians chapter 1 verse 16 to 18 it says for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things in him all things consist he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the first born from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence so one more thing we can find here from here is all things consist in jesus christ is in us and we are in christ john also writes in john 17 so that, that they may be they may be in me and we be in them so so that we may be one so christ is in us and we are in christ and the main theme of book of ephesians is church is in christ we are in christ you know a beautiful thing we always greet you know brother in christ when we go to when we meet some new people and say you know you are a brother in christ you are a sister in christ your father and child to me in christ we are one family in christ so in christ god brought us together and we are in him and he is in us and so that he may be all in all and this is talking about the union or between humanity and the divinity so in christ god brought uh, you god brought humanity and divinity together and theologically later we can talk about his you know, human vicarious humanity also how he is 100% god and 100% man as a 100% god he is reflecting or he is um, revealing Uh, god to us and as 100 percent man he united humanity unto g unto god and offering uh, the worship on our behalf and the responding to father on our behalf so these things are developed by apostle paul only so apostle paul very strongly believed and uh, preached about our union 
with God, then he, uh, he taught that we are always in God and God is in us. And we'll, we'll, we'll move to the next theme. Equality of all humanity. Okay. And uh, as a Pharisee, Pharisees cannot accept other, other uh, I mean, religious people or Gentiles as part of their, uh, their religion. Uh, in fact, if you read the Bible, uh, uh, from Exodus onwards, the Jewish religion starts. In the beginning, in, in, in the writings from in the Pentateuch, we find uh, uh, the provisions that God made for Gentiles to join the flock uh, of God, to join Israelites. Rehab is one, of, one among them who could join. And uh, Ruth was one among them who could join uh, uh, Jewish, uh, I mean, uh, Judaism. And there are so many uh, examples we can find even in the uh, Old Testament. And this is, an, a surprise, this is a surprising thing that this um, uh, Ruth and Rehab, these all were, these, these two ladies were in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. These are Gentile women. And God brought them into Jewish flock or his own flock. And he united them already. And through them, his Messiah has come into the world. God has united uh, the Gentiles and uh, Jews. But unfortunately, Judaism grew in a, way, in a way where they brought more and more restrictions. And they brought more and more boundaries. Uh, where Gentiles cannot come into the temple. Uh, they separated this God is only their God and Gentile gods are other gods and uh, which uh, people call it uh, henotheism. You know, Ju Judaism was not, from, from the beginning, it was not monotheism. For a while, it is henotheism. Henotheism is like the, they recognize there are many gods, but they are committed to one God. That's the reason where many places in the, uh, the Old Testament we find people say, I came in the name of the Lord. And uh, in some places it is written, the God of Israel, Israel, Israel is powerful. What about the God of, God of Philistines? And God of Israel is called God of Hills. That's why Psalms are there. I, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? And God of Philistines and other gods are called God of Valleys. And they say God, there was a culture in those days. If two countries come into war, if one country wins over the other, other, other country, they say the God of this country defeated the other God and has granted victory to them. So this was the culture and this was these were the beliefs uh, Israelites were having throughout the Old Testament. But from um, Babylonian captivity, the Israel, Judaism has taken entirely a new direction and it has changed a lot. And there, there are three different kinds of Judaisms we can find in the Bible. The Judaism we find in the New Testament, the Judaism we find after exile, the Judaism we find before exile are entirely different. Uh, so if we study, we understand one thing common through all of these. That is God united his people and he made provision for Gentiles also to come into his flock. But slowly, uh, the Jews separated and he's, he chased uh, Gentiles out actually. They, they put Gentiles out and they, they considered Gentiles like dogs. Uh, in such a way we can find, I mean, such expressions we can find, even in the New Testament, we find such expressions. They separated even their own uh, group of people, the 10 tribes of people, you know, they don't, uh, Samaritans, look at Samaritans, they don't consider them as to pure Jews. They, they, they go and say, worship in other places. Of course, we know the story of Rehoboam and Zerobam and how these things have come. <laughs> Uh, so there is always separation and the lines were drawn by Jewish people. And you, you remember the reason Apostle Paul was arrested in the uh, Jerusalem was the, the, and he was accused saying bringing Gentiles into the temple. That is the reason he was arrested. So the Jewish people, they built so many walls with the religions, uh, with the religion. And, uh, and Apostle Paul says, 
he was a Pharisee, so he was also one among them. And after his reformation, he brings this uh, teaching that equality of all humanity. God accepts all humans. Uh, even Ebionism, as we talk about. The Jerusalem Council Council, if you remember, we discussed in Act, uh, from Acts chapter 15, where uh, it was very difficult for Gen Jewish people to accept a Gentile coming into the flock of God. Uh, primarily because of the uh, sorry because of the experience Apostle Peter had the vision and his experience with in the Cornelius house and uh, the miracles that took place in the ministry of Paul and Barnabas many of these Jews could not talk but still they wanted uh, the Gentiles to be circumcised somehow they want to make Gentiles Jews okay uh, so Paul, he very strongly opposed that. So why uh, the reason they wanted Gentiles also to be Jews because they could not consider uh, themselves equal with others. They always had this superiority complex. They want to make them, they want to make equal, equal with them, you know. And uh, so somehow some kind of procedure has to be happened so that their grade can be brought up so that they can mingle with them. So they had this problem. And that is one of the reasons Apostle Paul uh, <clears throat> got uh, uh, Titus circumcised, not uh, Titus, uh, Timothy. His father was a Gentile and uh, he got Timothy circumcised. For Titus, he made sure he, uh, that, that was a end. First, first disciple was Timothy, second disciple was Titus. So with the Titus, he wanted to very strongly teach about the equality of all. So he may he kept him as a Gentile and he brought him into the church. So reading book of um, uh, Acts and then uh, the Titus and Timothy, these books, they will give us a lot of uh, information about these matters. So... Um, there is a wall between Jews and Gentiles religiously, which upper, which Jesus has broken. The walls were broken, which was taught by Paul only. Even in the beginning, the apostles were not very comfortable to go to Gentiles. See, we were, they were waiting in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came and they were ministering only in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Then came Philip. God, he, God took Philip to Samaria and he, they, their miracles and all happened. And to, so by difficulty, they accepted Samaritans. And after Paul, had, God has to take Peter to Cornelius. And these people were supposed to go, but God has to take them. They be, because in the beginning, they were believing salvation is only of the Jews. And it is only for the Jews, not for all. So that is the reason they were preaching gospel also only to the Jews. They did not teach to the Gentiles. But God broke all that. Uh, so Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5 verse 14. Uh, oh, sorry, not this. Uh, uh, one, thing, one thing we can understand is that all, all are made one. Uh, there are, uh, sorry, this is the words. In verse 26, uh, some, somewhere I forgot where is this. Uh, Paul says, uh, For uh, you, are, uh, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many, uh, sorry, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is no neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and the hair of a uh, hair of uh, hair according to the promise given to Abraham. So in Christ, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, no slave, uh, no free man, there is no male, there is no female. And um, so all are made one, all are equal. And uh, we, uh, I, and it is so unfortunate in our country, you know, sometimes. Certain churches are below certain churches belong to only certain community of people, and others cannot come. And uh, it's so unfortunate for us also uh, in the church. 
especially these things come up when we arrange a marriage. Unfortunately, in church also, caste is playing a role uh, when we come to marriage. So we all have differences. Somebody high caste is look differently. And, uh, it, you know, I have seen uh, and heard stories about these. Uh, in a place like Goa kind of place, uh, 25 years, 25, 30 years ago, there were see a few, certain pews were reserved for certain communities of people only. And uh, I always go, I know I and Pastor Dan, we travel several places where we, people want to put special chairs and all. We know how uncomfortable it is to sit on those special chairs because we know we all are one. And uh, I, I know some, there are pastors who get offended if they are not put special chairs for them. And they don't want to sit with the members or they don't want to sit with the crowd. And they don't, I know in my own family, uh, when certain functions happened and all, when we invited priests, uh, they, they feel so uncomfortable to sit with others and to have a meal. They have to be taken to a separate special room and set, set dinner for them separately and specially and their menu should be better than the people what they get here <laughs> and it is so unfortunate okay so as per uh, you know jesus says you now in parables don't go and sit in the front front seats <laughs> if somebody bigger than us comes <laughs> we'll be humiliated however however there are differences we are seeing in the church but apostle paul says that there is no difference no high no low uh, no rich no poor uh, and uh, no uh, slave this is a big statement slavery is speaking against it no slave no free no male no female and we know uh, certain churches may female have to sit on the floor male can sit only male only can sit on the chairs even in our own country. Okay? So there, there is nothing of such sort. All are equal. We all are one. We all are standing at the foot of Jesus Christ. That is one thing Apostle Paul <clears throat> was bringing. Another thing he is bringing very strongly about... Uh, um, uh, oh, sorry. I just copied wrong words, I guess. So overall, uh, he what says all. all uh, no, I don't a wrong scripture here from the other slide. Uh, anyway, one thing we understand from here is Apostle Paul teaches all humanity is equal. We all are standing at the foot of uh, Jesus Christ. And one uh, one good place we can see is Romans chapter three. In Romans chapter three, we can see all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And chapter one, he explains how Gentiles fell into sin and they, they deserve the wrath of God. And then he, from chapter two to chapter three, he explains how Jewish people also were into sin. And Jewish people were feeling great about themselves because they have the law. And he says, those are not having the law. That's why they are into sin and they are uh, they, they deserve the wrath of God. And in Romans chapter two, he says, and you people are swallowing the temples itself. You have the law and you are doing even much more simpler than them. So uh, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No Jew is right, no righteous, no, no, no Jew is better than uh, others. So we all are equal. We all fall short of the glory. Uh, I mean, uh, God's glory and we all require God's grace to, uh, to find salvation for us. So that is another statement what uh, Apostle Paul brought and which is very strong actually. The reason you may say yeah, it's a very simple thing why we should talk much about it but because Apostle Paul was the first apostle and main apostle who spoke about it. Well, you, you read the stories of Peter. Peter and all, they in the beginning they accepted it. You know, in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, Apostle Paul writes how he um, confronted Peter. Okay, and he says, Paul, uh, Peter was uh, in that particular experience. I'm talking about uh, Peter. He was he was a Jew. If he lives like a Jew, he should not go to house of a Gentile. But he goes to the house of the Gentile and was me eating meal with the, with them. And when some Jews come, he doesn't want them to recognize him 
joining gentiles in the meal so he tried to hide see the kind of hypocrisy or whatever uh, so when just remember uh, this this happened after cornelius experience in the cornelius experience itself people peter should learn that god accepted all gentiles and we all are equal but unfortunately he could not take it completely where apostle paul had to confront him that does not mean i'm not saying uh, peter was a racist uh, so kindly don't misunderstand what I'm, what i'm saying but there is a difficulty in the early church between the jewish christians and gentile christians where jewish christians were feeling superior than gentile christians which was nullified and which was confronted by apostle paul that is the reason speaking about humanity equality of all humanity is very important and no other apostle spoke uh, strongly as paul did so there are some a few other themes perhaps uh, um, we'll stop here and which we can i mean the rest of the uh, themes we can discuss in the next week uh, so if you have any questions feel free to ask and if you have any comments uh, please feel free to add and uh, any suggestions also uh, you can make Okay, maybe I'll start. Uh, uh, Praveen, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> about Paul being the architect for uh, promoting Trinitarian thinking. Uh, but I think many of us still struggle, especially when we pray. We always visualize one, one person we are praying to like a grandfather figure. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, can we also begin to think in a Trinitarian way where we are being ministered? I think you mentioned we must experience God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and not just one grandfather figure. Uh, we need to recognize we need to be ministered. As we pray, we are being ministered by the Father, the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Spirit. Anybody wants to say anything about that? Or Praveen, can you throw some more light? How can we experience God when we pray as Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Definitely, I would love to do that. Uh, but the, then I will become helpless. Next Sunday, I'm, I need to preach. <laughs> <laughs> Are you preaching on this subject? <laughs> I'm preaching on the same subject. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Maybe if the others have any thoughts on that, uh, perhaps, you know, it can help you. I think Bertie wants to say something. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bertie. Yes. Uh, when praying to the Father, I always see the Father as we all should. And it's clearly mentioned the, how the Trinitarian uh, one God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit has its working in our lives and completes us and the same love they share with us. When I pray to the Father, I always look at him as God, Word and Spirit. Always consider that uh, I, I think this Father, Son was never mentioned in the Old Testament. It uh, Because of the Christ coming from God, I mean, very God, 100% uh, God and 100% man, he took on the form of the Son of God, Son of Man. And the, and the Trinitarian father, sir, father, the father is God there. So I don't have any difficulty, Ms. Zakara, as you say, uh, thankfully, uh, that I look to the father as grandfather or one person. We do know that we're praying to the one God, but I'm always, I'm quite clear in my mind. Uh, I hope it will help others. That when I'm praying to the father, I look to him as God, word and spirit, one God. And the son is same. The son is father, uh, son, father, and spirit. Uh, in fact, in the old covenant, uh, it's mentioned somewhere, I think Deuteronomy or somewhere, where his name, the son, Jesus Christ, is called the mighty God, the everlasting father. Christ Jesus, the son of God, is mentioned as the everlasting father, prince of peace, wonderful counselor. At the same time, I look at the Holy Spirit 
as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, I mean, the three in one. So um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm not having a difficulty looking to the Father as a Father, as a grandfather figure, as just a Father, uh, you know, excluded from the Trinitarian, you know, and Christ, Son of God, excluded. They all are working in oneness. Okay. Um, yes, Anil, go ahead. Well, the scriptures clearly, clearly say the Father, Son, and Spirit are all united as one. Jesus says, I am the Father and Father and me. And, and he also prays that we also be united with him and with the Father. So when we are praying to God or Christ or, or the Holy Spirit, aren't we automatically praying uh, to the Trinity as such? Because they're all united as one. So they're all in one. Yes, we do. Yeah, may I add a couple of thoughts? Sure. May, may I add a couple of thoughts? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you asked uh, how we can uh, work on this so that we can have a Trinitarian experience uh, in our spiritual life. Number one thing I would like to say is there is no formula for us to do that. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One example I will give you, which is from the scripture, how Holy Spirit work in us so that we may have this uh, threefold Trinitarian experience. In the scripture, we already previously I mentioned the how Trinity, uh, threefold experience humans can have. And uh, I'll give you other script, many scriptures uh, next week uh, <clears throat> where Apostle Paul explains the threefold experience of uh, Christians. One example which is known very, very, very much to all of us is we, uh, Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. When we don't know how to pray, the spirit prays for us with, from within our spirit. And he says, calling Abba, Father. So this is not something we are doing it. This is something Holy Spirit is working in us. He is working in us, calling us and making us to call, call God as Abba, Father. So which means Holy Spirit is working in us so that we may recognize God in a Trinitarian perspective and experience the Trinitarian experience, number one. And beginning thing, if you read first John also, John says, nobody who have the spirit of God curses Christ. Only by the spirit of God, we call Jesus as a son of God. Whoever does not uh, curses Christ, he doesn't have the spirit of God. So Holy Spirit, again, he's working in us. So, and he is making us to consider and to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Again, Holy Spirit is working to help us to have the Trinitarian experience. And what does Holy Spirit do? He will lead us into the whole truth. He will teach everything that my father, whatever I want, my father wants to teach or whatever we want to reveal, Holy Spirit will reveal to us. That's what Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. So what is he doing? Holy Spirit, again, he is working in us and communicating Father and the Son to us. So primary thing, what I would like to say is there is no formula and there is no strategy for us to work from our side to have this Trinitarian experience. If we have, what is going to happen is it is going to become mechanical and it is going to become another religious ritual kind of practice it will become. So uh, I feel the uh, Holy Spirit is working in that sense. And uh, as Paul also wrote in Philippians, he who started a good work in you will also bring it to the completion. He's talking about Jesus. So Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three of them are working in us. It is not our job completely to make, oh, I'm believing in Trinity, so I need to train my mind. Somehow I need to, when I pray, I need to imagine or pictureize three persons and one being and these, that, that's how I need to pray. No, we don't need to. It is the work of God. So be relaxed as Vanessa several times has the same thing. So relax if you pray to Jesus, Father hears because Father is in Jesus. If you pray to the Father, Jesus is in the Father. They are in the Holy Spirit. So don't be uh, troubled by these. Am I praying to the right person or not? Okay. So three of them are in us. As Jesus prayed, uh, I in you, they are you in me, and they in us, and we in them. So we all are united to God. So there is no difference. So uh, as Jesus said, 
you know, come to me, all who labor and have a heavy laden, I will give you rest. Believe that. He is working in us. So what do we do with your uh, uh, sermon next week now? <laughs> you, you can watch it on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring other perspective, of course. <laughs> okay. right. Yeah, I think that's uh, some interesting thoughts coming up there. Mm. Any other thoughts on that, on that particular point, or any other points that anyone would like to bring up? Yeah, to talk to you. Anil, you have a question? No, no, I was just going through the points and seeing if there is it. Not really. Okay. Well, while you're still thinking, maybe I'll throw in another one. Uh, <laughs> right? In the union with God, Paul's theology of union with God, you you uh, quoted him saying that Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. Uh, I'm just wondering if we sometimes must learn, we must try to distinguish that from some of the philosophies that teach today that God is in us or we are divinity. And there are some Christian groups that teach that we will become gods. Uh, in fact, we taught in the past that we are actually going to become gods. And uh, there is, you know, one which is uh, specifically talks about how uh, we are gods. So I was just wondering if this, we can uh, make sure that there are distinctions there and how the Christian perspective is unique. Yeah, here comes uh, the work of philosophy that which will be little little helpful. The philosophy which was used by the early church. And when we talk about unity, you know, unity does not make any sense if there is no distinction. If there is distinction, then only unity makes sense. So unity is not possible without diversity. So uh, without uh, without. Uh, diversity, sorry, without unity means, again, everything is divided. Okay, so unity and uh, diversity, they go together. When they go, both of them go together, then only uh, that, may, that, makes a, that makes sense. Otherwise, it won't. So we are talking about the unity with Christ. So there is a very much, very serious need for, for us to have distinction. Otherwise, this union does not make any sense. So we are we, so we are not going to become all kinds of gods running around never creating chaos all over. <laughs> never. <laughs> if God wants us to become like gods, he would have created us like gods. <laughs> Directly. Right. There is no need for this evolution. Yes, Vanessa. Uh, so uh, last time the say uh, I had asked a question about this trinity. I asked about uh, like uh, our savior, who is our creator, who is our redeemer, and who is our savior. Now, if you say there are three in one, so they will have particular roles. So does the, does the creator be God, the savior, Jesus, and the redeemer, the Holy Spirit? Or Yeah, that particular uh, teaching was very quietly spread among the Christian world, but which is not right. Okay. Uh, so if you consider God, the father is the only creator in book of John, it is written. There is nothing that was created without him. Talking about Jesus, all things are created through him. So we, we, how can we say God, the father only is the creator. And in Corinthians, it is written, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting the trespasses against them. Who, who is redeeming us? Who is saving us? Is it Jesus or the father? It is written, God was in Christ. Okay? And the Holy Spirit, he walks uh, with, uh, along with them. So when we talk about creation, it is a work of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three of them are involved. 
number one. And number two, when we talk about redemption, three of them are involved. When we talk about our sanctification with the Holy Spirit, three of them, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three of them are involved. Three of them work together. They don't work. Okay, Jesus, you do this job that is for you and I'll do my job. This is my role. That is, They don't separate on um, roles, but they lead certain roles. Father took the uh, he took the lead to read the creation. Jesus he was sent by the Father. If you say Jesus is the Savior, uh, his redemption is his role. Who sent? G Father sent. So uh, Jesus is doing that spear spearheading certain roles, but three of them are working together in those roles. So uh, believing God is, uh, Father is the creator, Jesus is the redeemer, Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies or, or uh, glorifies, or this, this is not the uh, right understanding. So from the beginning, three of them are working together. And uh, if you take this way, what the problem comes is our understanding of God will be limited only to the roles. We cannot see God beyond the roles. There was a time where God was not a creator. God was God and at a particular point of time he created, then he became a creator. There was a time where God was not a redeemer because God was there at a particular point he created and sin came and uh, at a particular point he redeemed. So from a particular point he became the redeemer. So considering God, uh, understanding God through the roles will lead us into all sorts of wrong beliefs. So God is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit from eternity past to eternity future. In between, they did these uh, roles and where all of them work together and each role, certain person, one person have taken the spearhead. Does it make any sense? Right. Yeah, you can think of it like, <clears throat> you know, uh, like a team. It's a combined effort, uh, but uh, God is much, much beyond just, you know, any particular role, like I think Praveen explained. I think that is very important for us to understand. God is so much more than just a creator or a redeemer. Uh, he is a relational God and he, you know, will uh, enjoy a relationship with us for all eternity. Okay, we are almost close to time, but we can accommodate any other comments. Any, any other comments you'd like to make? Uh, Anil, you had a thought, no? All right. Okay, then, uh, Praveen, you have any concluding thoughts? We'll continue with the other themes in the following weeks. All right, so uh, let's conclude here. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Uh, and as we sign off, uh, just remember the Nerale family as they go through the, the, the loss uh, and just pray that God will grant them his grace and mercy. Uh, so let's end if I can if Vincent is still there, Vincent, may I request you to, uh, uh, you know, close with a prayer? Sure. Oh. Almighty God, Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity of being together, listening to your word through one of your servants, Praveen, explaining us extracts from scripture. Help us to understand whatever has been taught us. Help, help us and guide us that we live a life that is worthy. And I and I pray, Almighty God, for comfort to the Nerale family. Sachin is in Jakarta 
help him to return home safely, Almighty God. Bless their family, comfort their family. Help us to remember them. In these next few days, Almighty God, when the funeral will take place. Bless each one of us and those who couldn't attend for this Bible study meeting. Guide us, help us that we that we stay healthy, maintain a healthy life, a healthy life for our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives in us. Help us to respect our bodies. And I pray especially for the elderly people in the church. Keep them in your loving care, Father, and their families. <coughs> we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.